This is the Moral Science Podcast, and I'm your host, Amber Cazell. In this series, I get to interview experts in my favorite subject, the scientific study of human morality, virtues and vices, evolution of morals, the judgment action gap, character development, the philosophy of morality, transcendent experiences, researchers' moral biases, cultural values, plus the obligatory trolley dilemma. We are going to talk about it all. Dr. Steven Pinker is a Johnstone Family Professor of Psychology at Harvard University. He conducts research on a number of topics, including visual cognition, psycholinguistics, and social relations. His work has received a number of prestigious prizes, including the Trolland Research Prize from the National Academy of Sciences. In addition to his impressive scholarly work, Dr. Pinker has also drawn attention as a public intellectual. He's a frequent contributor to the New York Times and has written nine books, including the New York Times bestsellers, The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now. In this podcast, we discuss humanism and his popular books, trends of declining violence, and the general state of moral psychology. Hi everybody, Amber here. The Moral Science Podcast is launching a Patreon page. Some of you may know that I am not compensated for this podcast. I pay for microphones, cloud recording, audio transcriptions, and sound visualizers out of pocket. I also do all the invitations, audio editing, episode uploading, and social media posting on my own. If you enjoy the podcast, your tips and support on Patreon would mean a lot to me. Please consider becoming a patron at www.patreon.com forward slash moral science. Thanks so much, and I hope you enjoy this interview. All right. Hi, everybody. Today, I am very excited to be here with Steven Pinker, and I think we're going to have a lot of really interesting things to discuss, so I'm going to just go ahead and jump right in. Um, Steve, I usually start these podcasts by hearing about a researcher's background and what led them to their line of... um, research and work. And I know in your case, you study a lot of different things. And so I'm curious how over the years you became more interested in moral psychology. Um, When I was speaking with Jesse Graham last year on this podcast, he mentioned that he felt your New York Times article, The Moral Instinct, actually, this is when I first read it, um, that that really drew attention and popularized moral foundations theory and brought a lot of attention to moral psychology in general. So I'm curious how you developed that interest on your own. I've always been interested in moral philosophy and ethics, probably starting with my my religious education, which was Reform Judaism. And there was very little theology. There was uh, uh, no no miracles, no uh, uh, not even so much God, but uh, there was an awful lot of uh, ethical argumentation. I even became a Sunday school teacher. I taught 11 year olds, and, uh, but the subject that I was, one of the main subjects uh, that I was uh, uh, deputized to teach was um, moral philosophy, ethical uh, debates. We had a textbook called The Right Way with Moral Dilemmas, which of course is exactly how moral philosophy is, uh, uh, is, is done. Uh, you clarify your principles by uh, seeing how they could, ought to apply in difficult moral decisions. My, my work in, uh, my professional work in psychology did not make contact with that, that lifelong interest for, for quite a while, but I did, I am interested in uh, all aspects of human nature. I've, uh, I wrote a book with the uh, grandiose title, How the Mind Works. Uh, and so if it has to do with the, uh, with, with the human mind, I'm interested in it, and in uh, and I think a, a kind of preparation for my interest in moral psychology was my interest in visual perception, hmm. uh, and where the, uh, uh, the 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 key issue there, going back to to Helmholtz and probably earlier, is uh, are there uh, do we have faculties that are uh, grappling with uh, uh, an external reality that may um, subject us to illusions and fallacies when we're confronted with uh, atypical situations? Uh, and can we contrast uh, a kind of uh, veridical perception with a set of illusions that our brains uh, make us vulnerable to? So that's an obvious question to ask when it comes to, say, the perception of depth and color. Uh, is it a question that we can also ask when it comes to right and wrong? Are there um, some 
moral intuitions that feel overwhelming as we feel them, but that can't, um, uh, can't withstand the kind of uh, scrutiny uh, of the kind that we apply when we pull out a ruler to show that the, uh, the, the bent or is really straight or the two lines that appear to be on equal lengths really are on equal lengths. Now, of course, that raises the uh, question in philosophy of, uh, of really moral realism, namely, is there right. any moral ground truth against which we can compare human judgments? Uh, and um, and that, uh, needless to say, there's much to be uh, debated on that issue. Right, yeah, and um, the moral instincts, that was a, a phrase you used a few times, and these moral illusions, and there was a suggestion, the sense that I was getting as I was reading was that you thought our, our minds can be fooled by these moral illusions and um, the backdrop, and we need to compare that to figure out how morality ought to be deployed, how we ought to use these various moral instincts. So I, I'm, I'm curious, I, I know it's a broad question and it's complicated, but how do you personally distinguish between what is a moral illusion and what is more real? Yeah, well, another, um, uh, another prompt or, or, or stimulus to raising these questions was the, the work that I've done on the um, historical decline of violence mm -hmm. and the ways in which practices and customs that were seen as perfectly either neutral or unexceptionable or, or even moral in their times now are abhorrent to us, slavery being the obvious example, but also the, the burning of heretics, the uh, persecution of of uh, gay people, um, the uh, uh, debt bondage, uh, uh, animal cruelty as a form of entertainment, or for that matter, um, public torture executions as, a, as an occasion to bring out the whole family for an afternoon of fun to see someone um, uh, burned to death uh, or, or clawed with iron hooks. Uh, what, what were these people thinking? Clearly, uh, you know, to the extent that we can make a judgment now, slavery really is wrong. And the people who thought it was okay, uh, they, they were mistaken. Now, to the extent that we can make that judgment, we feel very uh, confident in it. What are we appealing to? How can, what makes us so sure that slavery is wrong, given that it seemed perfectly natural to most of humanity for, for most of history? Uh, so uh, that, um, that itself raises the question of whether we can be mistaken about our moral convictions. Uh, but also the, uh, the, the work done by um, Rick Schwader and John Haidt and Alan Fisk and, uh, and Josh Green and the whole enterprise of moral psychology that uh, suggests that there are intuitions that people can have which they cannot defend. That is, and, and you know, classic examples from John Haidt, who are now classic, such as consensual uh, incest, such as disrespecting the flag in a private, such as breaking a deathbed vow where um, uh, no, no one's hurt. Um, the moral case that wrong has been done is, is not trivial to make, but and nonetheless, people have strong intuitions which they're dumbfounded uh, when called upon to justify. So that's another hint that as with perception, there is a distinction between our, uh, our intuitions and what we might want uh, to call reality, that, that of course is uh, self tendentious, but um, uh, certainly if you at least distinguish what we can uh, argue is right or wrong, uh, defend is right or wrong, uh, as the kind of ground truth, how do our uh, gut intuitions of morality diverge from that? Yeah, I, I, I think that that is interesting. It sounds like you use rationality as the litmus test for um, how moral something is. Is that fair? Um, not necessarily because okay. the <laughs> rationality per se as philosophers since, uh, since Hume have pointed out cannot by itself ground morality. Right. But I, do, I do tend to think that rationality combined with uh, a couple of fairly um, uh, unexceptional assumptions. Number one, each of us cares about our own uh, existence and well-being and flourishing. Uh, if we if we didn't, we probably wouldn't have uh, wouldn't be here to, to to debate them. If we didn't work to stay alive and keep ourselves well fed and, and healthy, so 
uh, as soon as you've got a rational agent who's an incarnate being, you're talking about some agent who at least is concerned with uh, himself or herself. Again, that's not rational, but it's hard to imagine how we would be us without it. And that we're, uh, we're social. We are, our our uh, well-being depends on how others treat us. Uh, we're in discourse with other people. And again, that's uh, the very fact that we're raising these issues means we already are in discourse with each other. Mm. Now, you put those together, um, the rationality, uh, self-interest, and, uh, and some degree of sociality. And I, think, I tend to think that morality fall, falls out of that. Namely, uh, as, soon, uh, uh, as soon as I Im implore you to do anything that respects my interests, you know, not to kill me, not to exploit me, not to rape me, not to, to uh, torture me, um, I can't very well turn around and say, well, it's okay for me to do it to you. Uh, and, and there, I think there are two reasons. It'd be nice if we could reduce it to, to one, and maybe maybe a cleverer philosopher than, than, than uh, <laughs> I could do it. But one of them is, this, just logically, there's no distinction between me and you. Uh, uh, me is just uh, uh, the way I refer to a person when the words come out of my mouth, and you, when, um, uh, when it, you use the word you, referring to me when it comes out of your mouth. But as long as we are in discourse and we're appealing to some kind of coherence in the realm of ideas, uh, me and you makes no difference. So any argument you make about me um, has to be true of you. Once you grant that, you have a lot of the normative statements of morality that have uh, emerged uh, and persisted through the ages, the golden rule, uh, the categorical imperative, the um, veil of ignorance, the view from nowhere, the perspective of eternity. All of these are forms of uh, impartiality. I think it was mm -hmm. uh, Sidgwick who, who kind of named it that. Uh, they're all ways of saying the difference between me and you ultimately can't bear any, any, any burden in a rational argument. What's true of me has to be true of you. Um, the other grounding, uh, in addition to that logical distinction, is that uh, it's so much easier to cause damage than to help. That's probably a consequence of the second law of thermodynamics, that a complex system uh, is vulnerable to disorder, even through, through, through random changes. Um, that if we refrain from harming each other, uh, we're both better off than even than if we had some symmetrical arrangement where you know, I get to kill you, you get to kill me. Um, granted, going back to our first grounding of morality, there's nothing in that that it privileges me or you, but nonetheless, it's obviously not an arrangement that uh, either of us would want, uh, where each of us is willing to sacrifice our prerogative to harm the other in exchange for not being uh, vulnerable ourselves, not being harmed or exploited ourselves, and we, we, we kind of, everybody wins. I mean, it's granted the best situation for me selfishly would be if I get to exploit everyone else and no one gets to exploit me. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, I'm not going to be able to convince you that that's a viable arrangement. And we're really, it's both in each of our rational self-interests to enforce a social contract in which neither gets to exploit the other. And that is another kind of grounding of, of morality, namely um, not, uh, not just um, avoid writing any rule or system that privileges me over you, but figure out a set of rules where we uh, all are better off uh, agreeing to the rules than if we uh, flouted them. I see, yeah, thank you. And so as I've sort of looked at your work in summation, you mentioned um, better angels of our nature. I've read Enlightenment Now as well, which was really good. Um, these all imply to me that you have a sense of moral progress and that's already that's already come up just in our conversation it seems that you have a sense that moral progress is occurring um but there's sort of an arrow to the direction of of morality and i um i wonder if you think that certain societies are also like more advanced with respect to moral progress? That sounds like a very provocative idea to me, but I've gotten that sense from you. And I, and I would like to hear from you about whether that is accurate or inaccurate or sort of your thoughts on that. 
Yes, no, and you're, and you're right to identify the, uh, the dilemma according to contemporary sensibilities. And I do think that a lot of the intellectual world has tied itself into a, uh, a contradiction or a knot, because mm -hmm. on the one hand, you've got the uh, radical relativism that has become sacrosanct in large parts of academia. No society is better than any other society. On the other hand, you really do have commitments like uh, women shouldn't be exploited and there shouldn't right. be slaves. Now, you can't believe in both of those things. You can't believe that uh, women should have equal rights and say, well, it's perfectly fine if a society uh, you know, enslaves and mutilates and uh, uses as women as sexual slaves. That, well, that's just their culture, and who are we to criticize it? I mean, you just can't have both. Uh, and so the, the answer is, if we have any kind of uh, moral convictions at, at all, if we really do think slavery is, is, is bad, genocide is bad, we can't also say, well, that culture over there that, that, uh, perpet uh, that perpetrates genocide is just following the, the mores and values of that culture. We, we, you have to say that what they're doing is wrong. And uh, now this, um, so yes, it, it, a, a culture that, uh, that uh, outlaws slavery and um, sexual exploitation and uh, oppression of women and gay people and autocracy and uh, torture and so on really is morally um, more backward than, than one that doesn't. Uh, um, and I say backward knowing how freighted and uh, uh, incendiary that, that word is, because it does imply that there is such a thing as moral progress. And I do think there is such a thing as moral progress, that if you abolish slavery, that's progress. If you eliminate laws that, just, that uh, oppress gay people, that really is progress. I think it is a, a current, uh, I don't think it's magic, um, and I don't think it is linear or irreversible or in the nature of things. I think it comes about because to the extent that a society uh, allows open debate, discourse, discussion, the, uh, co the conversation is going to move in certain directions. Uh, in the same way that if you allow mathematicians to do their thing and criticize each other, uh, the, the idea that one and one equals three just isn't going to survive for very long. Um, mm -hmm. Just because one and one isn't three. And likewise, as soon as you uh, play the moral game at all, um, any argument that slavery is okay is just going to fall by the wayside. Likewise, that it's okay to discriminate against uh, gay people or to uh, uh, oppress women. The arguments are bad and uh, you can suppress them, you can uh, fail to um, notice them, but once they're out there, they, I, they, uh, and as long as you don't get to kill the people who disagree with you, then the, the, uh, as long as you're in an arena of open debate, better ideas will, in the long run, uh, push out worse ideas. Uh, so uh, this, uh, returning to the, 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 uh, the political uh, uh, minefield that this mm -hmm. uh, 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 tiptoes through, uh, this can't be um, equated with some kind of Western chauvinism, saying, well, hooray for the West. Because right. the West, of course, is, uh, has and still does do repugnant things. I mean, mm -hmm. the West had you know, plenty of slavery and, and, and denial of the, the, the vote and, and rights to, to women and, and all the rest and, and continues, continues to. And a lot of these ideas did not um, originate in the West and uh, were, are, were the West fought them tooth and nail and many parts of the West still do. So mm -hmm. it has to be an argument for the principles themselves uh, some Western countries, or some parts of some Western countries that sometimes do uh, endorse them. Uh, but it, the fact that, that, that it is a lot of Western countries is, uh, is irrelevant. So it's not hooray for the Netherlands, it's hooray for universal franchise, abolition of slavery, abolition of torture, uh, and all the rest. Yeah. How do you, um, so, so that I have a few thoughts on that. One is that I, I, agree i share i share your values but i but it does need to be pointed out that the reliance on this taking place in um a circumstance in which people are free to express their ideas is sort of itself this implicit privilege privileging of the value of freedom in this abstract sense so that's one thought i had the other the other thought that i had as you were speaking was um Oh boy, now I've lost my train of thought. 
Let's stick with just, I'm curious what you have to say about the, the freedom comment, and then hopefully the other idea will return to me as you're speaking. Sure. Yes, I'm, I'm, I'm well familiar with that, uh, that, <laughs> that state of mind, uh, all too familiar with it. Yeah, the, uh, well, the, the, the uh, value of freedom is almost presupposed if you're having a discussion at all uh, on anything. Right. So okay. if, we're, if we're having a, a, a debate, a disagreement, then each of us has to be free to articulate uh, views. Otherwise, we would settle it with a, you know, with a fist fight or a beauty contest or, a, or, or a, you know, or mutual whoever can bribe the other. Uh, the fact that we're engaged in intellectual discourse and we, we believe that it's worth discussing it in the first place as opposed to me bullying you or vice versa shows that we're already committed to freedom. It's too late. Uh, and of course, the commitment to freedom is part of the impartiality, the fact that I, I don't get to, uh, I'm not uh, omniscient or infallible, I don't get to impose my views just because I'm stronger than you, I've got to persuade you, and uh, that means I've got to allow you to try to persuade me. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, if you, there, there is the ground rule of uh, freedom of, of uh, speech and thought, uh, but the, we all exceed to that ground rule if we're even debating something as opposed to settling it by uh, brute force. And if we settle it by brute force, then we've got to say, okay, well, if, you're, um, if you can lock me up, if you can uh, torture me, if you can imprison me, then you win. Um, I don't think, since neither of us is willing to concede that, it's too late. We've already signed on to freedom. Okay. Yeah. And, and I did have the other thought returned to me, and it's related to this. Um, this idea that uh, of abstract principles in general, so like freedom is this abstract principle. You had said that, you know, morality, it has to be, it, it's not about like Western society, it's about commitment to the principles in and of themselves, these impartial principles. And it made me think of um, Tej Rai and Alan Fisk's relation, re relational models, I forget the exact, the exact name, but their, their theory yes, of sure. morality. What was it? Virtuous, virtuous Violence, yes, a, a brilliant book. Oh yes, that book. Um, yeah. I, I actually haven't read it, although I did read your introduction to it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, like, it made me think of that because these abstract principles and standing behind them is one thing. Um, how they actually get implemented into the world is quite another thing. And it can make adherence to these abstract principles in and of themselves tricky to implement. So for instance, like um, abstract principles of fairness, we see liberals and conservatives disagree on what fairness means in practicality. Um, and so do you think that there is a disconnect between rational discourse in being able to implement morality and make progress through rational discourse when there's sort of that, um, abstract and particulars gap going on? Yes, well, I think that the, um, the work by Alan Fisk and, and, and Taj Rai is fascinating as, uh, as, a, uh, uh, as a work of anthropology and psychology and sociology and history. And it shows why it's often so hard to arrive at what we would defend as the best moral principles. Because, and again, this, this harks back to the beginning of our conversation, not coincidentally, because um, Alan Fisk, like Jonathan Haidt, uh, worked with uh, Rick Schwader, right. and, uh, all of whom uh, highlight the differences in, or the, 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 the diversity of moral intuitions, mm -hmm. uh, and the way that different uh, cultures, different historical periods by different ways of, of uh, moral thinking, different foundations or different relational models to different domains of, of life. Uh, in particular, uh, much of the world and much of history and, and uh, us today often conflate morality with intuitions of purity, of uh, communal sharing, of um, deference to legitimate authority, uh, as well as to the uh, more central foundations or, or, or models of uh, um, caring, empathy, uh, avoidance of harm. Um, but that's, in, in, if you would peer into our skulls with a, a kind of a, a, a moral fluoroscope to see what's, uh, what people's moral thoughts are, a lot of them have nothing to do with uh, preventing harm and, and extending care. They have people judge violations of um, sexual uh, uh, purity, of dietary purity, of um, 
uh, of uh, insulting legitimate authority, of failing to take responsibility for uh, those that you're uh, uh, empowered to, uh, to protect paternalistically. All of those get conflated with morality in most societies at most times. But uh, this relates again to our discussion of, of moral relativism. If you acknowledge that that's the way we're wired, we're subject to these moral intuitions, they're powerful, they can uh, um, parametrically vary from culture to culture. Still, can you say that some are right and some are wrong? That is, even the cultures that thought slavery was okay, they were wrong, slavery is not okay. Not just that our culture doesn't like slavery in the way that our culture, say, doesn't like men wearing skirts, uh, but that it's really different. And likewise with genocide and rape and so on. And so uh, over the course of history, as a lot of these traditional spheres of morality, relational models, if you will, or, or, or moral foundations, start to get cast by the wayside, that when you start to say, I don't care if uh, gay sex grosses you out, uh, there's nothing wrong with it. And if it grosses you out, that's just too bad. You're going to have to swallow it, even though it, that uh, sense of um, your, your own sense of visceral discomfort, uh, which you are likely to translate into moral condemnation. Um, sorry, you're wrong about that. And um, so you know, keep, keep it to yourself. Learn to, to, uh, to, to overcome it. Uh, and that is a way in which uh, I, I think that the work of, um, of Fisk and of Haidt can be I think misinterpreted as, as licensing a kind of relativism, as fascinating as it is as psychology, namely outlining the kinds of moral fallacies that we're, we're all vulnerable to. It doesn't prevent you, I think, from also making the normative argument that uh, lots of people are wrong about a lot of things a lot of the time. Again, going back to perception in the same way that uh, appreciating human perception means that we can say, People are uh, vulnerable to, to uh, all the illusions on the back of the cereal box. You know, they think the two lines are a uh, different length and in reality, they're the same length. Or they, they think two colors are different in reality, that they're, they're uh, the same. And in the case of, you brought up the uh, book, Virtuous Violence by, um, uh, by Fisk and Rye. And that is in particular interest of, of interest. And the reason that I agreed to write a foreword is that it, uh, it uh, jibed with a conclusion that I came to in writing The Better Angels of Our Nature on the history and decline of violence, which is that if you were to try to uh, ask the question, why do people, I asked ask two questions. One of them is how did violence decline? The other one is why was there so much of it? Why is there still a lot of it? Psychologically, what is it that impels people to harm one another? Uh, one of the answers can be just sheer exploitation. Uh, a native population is on land that you want, so you clear them and you enjoy the land. Uh, you rob a liquor store, you shoot the clerk so that he doesn't identify you in court. Uh, there's a, um, a sexual exploitation. I don't think it needs a fancy, fancy explanation. It's just raw uh, callousness toward the interests of the victim. But the, I think a majority of the killings in human history have not been out of sheer exploitation. They've been out of moral reasons. The, uh, the genocides of the Nazis, of the, uh, the communists, of um, uh, many other episodes in, in history where there's been mass killings, the killers thought that they were doing the moral thing. They didn't accrue any material advantage out of their uh, violence. But they thought that that uh, they were uh, they were meeting out justice, mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, the uh, probably I, I, I have no exact way of quantifying this, but I suspect more people have been um, murdered in the pursuit of justice and morality than in the pursuit of than out of uh, raw exploitation, and that's a point that uh, Fisk and, and uh, uh, Ryan make in, in their excellent book. And so, what was the what was the reason, the conclusion for why that has gone away over time? But it seems yeah, like, it's, go, ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I think there are a number, I, I wasn't able to single out one grand historical cause. I think they, I, I singled out a number. One of them was um, the, um, the implementation of uh, the rule of law, as opposed to the, uh, uh, the chaos of, of uh, anarchy, that uh, if you've got the government disincentivizing you from exploiting someone else, it will make it not worth your while because of the anticipated cost of the punishment 
will negate whatever you hope to gain by, uh, by, by, by robbing or, or murdering or, or raping. Um, another is um, uh, infrastructure of, of exchange and commerce and uh, non-zero-sum uh, trade that uh, if, you're, if it's cheaper to buy things than to steal them, then uh, you're, you're less likely to be tempted by plunder. And if other people are more valuable to you alive than dead because you're getting stuff from them in exchange for stuff you're giving them, then uh, commerce replaces conquest. Mm -hmm. Another is the uh, e expansion of our sense of empathy, our moral concern, uh, so that we, uh, partly because of, perhaps because of artistic uh, rendering of the inner lives of other people. What is it like to be a black person in America? What is it like to be a slave? Uh, what is it like to be an animal? Uh, and partly out of, out of just rational discourse, how can you uh, really defend the idea that you get to keep slaves and someone else has to be slaves? Can, does that really, can you really defend that? Does that really make sense? So the combination of reason and empathy I, can expand our circle of uh, moral concern. And we can also um, apply our, our reason, our cognitive faculties to figuring out uh, ways of reducing violence as a, uh, as a problem to be solved, such as a uh, court system or restorative just, uh, justice or international organizations like the, uh, the UN and the uh, EU and uh, anger management and all of the different gimmicks and gadgets we come up with. Um, so do, is there anything they all have in common? Why should these forces all seem to push in the same direction? Uh, ultimately, I, I took a stab at saying that they all fall into this game theoretic um, dilemma that we spoke of at the beginning of the conversation. Namely, uh, since it's so much easier to uh, harm than, than to, to help, and, and you can do so much more damage by harming than, than by helping, uh, and since each of us is vulnerable to that kind of damage, a social contract uh, in which we all uh, refrain from harming each other in exchange for not being harmed ourselves is irresistible to a, a self-interested, rational, and social agent. Now, it's not automatic. Uh, our the various moral intuitions that uh, that that uh, Schwader and Haidt and Fisk have uh, have laid out means that we don't often see it that clearly because we. We, we, we value the authority, we value the uh, ascetic, we're disgusted by what other people do. So there are all these kind of emotional and cognitive impediments to seeing with clarity uh, the best way of arranging our affairs. But as long as you allow people to argue with each other, to point out each other's flaws in each other's reasoning, it tends to push in the direction of uh, greater uh, equality, uh, a fair social contract. We saw just the, um, if I can uh, date our conversation a little bit by referring to the events of yesterday when the Supreme Court ruled that uh, um, employers may not discriminate against gay or transgender employees, even a highly conservative Supreme Court, but they kind of were trapped by their own, uh, by, the, by the words of the law and, and words of laws that they themselves had to agree to. And then they to sort of crank through what they meant and what they applied. And uh, even if their own culture, even if their own intuitions uh, went against the judgment, the, uh, the judgment prevailed. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Um, I recall watching a lecture that you gave, I think it was at Harvard, um, and I think it might have followed a lecture that Josh Green gave, but in that lecture you were discussing the process of progress and how this takes place. And the things that you've said today have, have echoed that, but I remember some elements of that you were talking about the role of um, elites like academics and government and policymakers and and this sort of a thing and i'm wondering if you could for listeners just talk about that process for moral progress here so i thought that was really interesting and provocative um do you recall which lecture i'm talking about no, I'm, you know I, I remember the lecture uh, I'm not sure I can reconstruct the uh, the argument. If you could say another couple of words. Yeah, no problem. I, as I recall it, and this was some time ago, so I don't want to put words in your mouth. So um, 
just warning to listeners, I am trying to recall this from watching it a few months ago, but it was something along the lines of there's rational discourse amongst these powerful people in society. They come up with these new policies that the public initially dislikes, and then they lobby it into policy making. Eventually it's adopted despite upheaval amongst a lot of the a lot of the population but once it's implemented people see that life goes on and is improved and then um it becomes sort of the the commonly accepted universal new standard for i think okay now now it's coming back to me so i think this was an argument um uh i I am now now i'm suffering a brain freeze into uh as to the scholar that did this work but it was somebody who looked at the history of capital punishment in the West, and capital punishment is one of these phenomena, such as the abolition of slavery, the uh, abolition of laws that discriminate against women, against uh, gay people, where it, it feels like there's some historical tide. I mean, it's a, a nonsensical notion, but you just plot the number of countries that have abolished capital punishment, and it, it, it keeps going up. Uh, capital punishment might even vanish, even in the United States, which as with another number, number of American customs, we are very far behind the curve of, uh, mm-hmm. of um, liberal democracies. Uh, we still have capital punishment. Most of our, most other affluent democracies don't, but even the United States is diminishing. So how does that happen? Uh, how did this process uh, um, get propelled? And the answer is historically, it's not because there is a groundswell of popular opinion that people have demonstrations to abolish capital punishment. It often, on the contrary, starts from elites, from from jurists and journalists and uh, academics who make an argument that um, capital punishment is barbaric, it's uh, unfair, uh, it's, it's, it's primitive. And in countries, more often in Europe than in the US, where the intellectual and moral elites have a uh, say in the drafting of laws, uh, often they got to pressure governments to outlaw it at a time at which, if you took a, an opinion poll, most people would say, hey, capital punishment is only fair. You take a life, you deserve to lose your own. So the elites in, in this case are in the kind of in the vanguard ahead of the, the populaces. But once it does get outlawed, then people get used to it. They see that all hell hasn't broken loose. And so uh, they tend not to clamor for reinstating it. Now that there are exceptions, there are cases where there's a, you know, a gruesome, you know, rape, murder, or children get murdered, and there's a call to reintroduce it. But by and large, the momentum is uh, against reinstitution of capital punishment. Again, you know, some American states being an exception, but but, but they are an exception. Uh, yeah. That, that's a case where it's elites, not elites in the sense of the people with the uh, iron rule. Uh, but what I, by elites, I mean kind of intellectual, moral, journalistic elites. Hmm. So people with like social capital, you mean? Uh, yes, although not only social capital, because it isn't the plutocrats. It's not necessarily, it's not the, uh, the military elites. Um, it's in this case, the intellectual elites. Okay. Now that doesn't always, uh, that's not always the way it works. Um, there are grassroots changes. There are people who are um, uh, you know, not at the um, uh, necessarily you know, professors or clergy people or, um, or, or um, editorialists, but o- often it does even say you know, Martin Luther King, who was he an elite? I mean, in, in, in some ways, absolutely not. He was an African American at a time when they were terribly oppressed. On the other hand, he was a minister. He was highly educated. Um, uh, he had the, uh, he gained the, uh, a, a platform. Um, the women's suffrage movement, again, these weren't people who started out as elites, but often it was highly educated women who advanced the cause. I wouldn't want to say that this always happens. Uh, and it isn't true of all elites, such as financial or military or government elites, but there are times at which there are kind of moral thinkers who are in the vanguard uh, are ahead of public opinion and drag public opinion with them. Interesting. Okay, so you're using uh, elites more closely is aligned with education in a way? 
Is that exactly yes? Not not uh, not financial elites, but uh, okay. at least like you know, like you and me. Okay, interesting. <laughs> Very interesting. Do you think that? I think I think the question has to be asked that that that's sort of a stroke to the ego for us because we're intellectuals and and we think about these things. It, to what extent do you think that this is really? documented versus this idea that sort of feels good for an intellectual to talk about this idea that maybe we're driving moral progress forward um i don't i don't know that everybody would agree you know and and so i there there was you gave the example of capital punishment as sort of having this documented history are you aware of other um types of what you see as moral progress that also have that documented? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, a, a good point. And I certainly would not make the argument that the um, history of capital punishment is the way that all moral progress happens. That was a, a, what I found to be a very interesting case study. Right. Um, but, and, it, and it must be said that uh, a lot of intellectuals are, were behind uh, some of history's worst atrocities. Um, not only cases in which the elites disagreed amongst themselves, so you can't really even say what the elites uh, wanted, but um, cases where uh, there were rationales for, 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 for genocide, for oppression, from uh, the, the Nazis had plenty of intellectuals propping up their, uh, their ideology. Hitler was a, a kind of pseudo-intellectual. Uh, he fancied himself as, as uh, well, well read. Uh, the um, Marxist uh, genocidal regimes of the 20th century had no shortage of uh, intellectuals, including defenders in the, in the West, um, who's who, uh, who all too happy to say you can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs, the eggs there being millions of people. So yeah, I would not make the argument that intellectual elites are in general at the vanguard of uh, progress, although in the specific case of capital punishment, they seem to be. Okay, interesting. So as you have this, um, I think one of the things I really admire about your work is you have this panoramic view of research that's being done on morality, at least in psychology, but I think in some other disciplines as well. I'm curious what you anticipate being the future direction for moral science to take over the coming years or um, also like your opinion of what you think it should take over the next few years? Well, I, I do think it should be, uh, it should be eclectic, the disciplinary boundaries get in the way of uh, insight and understanding. So history is relevant and moral philosophy and um, moral psychology and anthropology uh, and, and economics. Uh, that we should apply every intellectual tool that, that uh, we have, and, and neuroscience, as in the work of uh, my colleague Josh Green, um, that uh, we should cl clarify um, issues such as uh, the to to what extent can we speak of a kind of ground truth when it comes to morality against which we can compare human judgment. We need clarity on that. Uh, I do think that uh, I, uh, the issue that you and I just discussed as to who and what drives moral progress when there is moral progress is something that I would like, love to see more, more work on. Um, you, you're right to, to be skeptical of uh, any suggestion that it's um, intellectual only to drive it in general, um, but uh, um, to what extent are there, uh, does it work by grassroots agitation, by community leaders who become elites by virtue of the power of their rhetoric and ideas and organization versus top-down intellectuals. How much harm do intellectuals do? I think that is actually an understudied topic for exactly the reason that you mentioned, namely that intellectuals like to flatter themselves. And it's actually quite appalling to see the kinds of positions that a lot of our lauded um, uh, intellectual heroes have taken, that uh, the, the number of um, intellectuals in the 20th century who praised uh, genocidal dictators like like Mao, um, like uh, even Hitler, uh, is uh, is kind of uh, uh, revolting. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That is that is interesting, and I wonder too. And I know you've 
over the years defended the the decline in violence so many times and I also wonder to what degree like your intellectual positioning as well as your your own positioning as a scholar in specifically the westernized world privileges a certain view of things like violence that could be indicators of moral progress that not all others would share. So certainly it seems you've defended really well a decline in violence in terms of like homicides and and things like this. Um, a friend of mine, when we were discussing the book Better Angels, and, and you know, caveat here is I have not read Better Angels myself, so I, I can't um, defend this friend's question, but they were saying they felt that perhaps a certain definition of violence was privileged that could exclude other types of violence that others might consider. So I don't know if in the book, for instance, you addressed um, abortion. Like some people would see that as um, a type of violence that might indicate a regression, a moral regression, or another type of violence that they brought up was this idea that there's no longer land that you can just go out and forage. There's sort of this mentality with large corporations of, well, you better work or starve. There's no land for you to just go out and, and be anymore. You really have to, um, you're really forced to labor or there are consequences. Now, I think you could also make the argument that that's been the case in a lot of, a lot of history, although, um, like also, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, um, <laughs> I'm not sure if you're familiar with Darsha Narvez's work. She's a, um, psychologist who has, she, she almost takes the opposite perspective from yours that there's been a, I mean, she really romanticizes hunter-gatherer times and thinks that quality of life has decreased over time, quality of life has decreased over time. And I think, you know, she points to some similar issues of, well, what about, what about the fact that people used to only gather for three hours a day and then kind of enjoy life and have more touch and, and these different other elements. So Perhaps this is a question you feel is beating a dead horse that you've talked about it so many times, I'm sure, but um, I, I am curious to get your answer in light of this conversation. Uh, sure, and, and I, I often get the objection, well, isn't such and such a form of violence too? Isn't inequality mm -hmm. a form of violence? Isn't obesity a form of violence? Uh, isn't advertising a form of violence? Mm -hmm. uh, and I the first answer is you can play with words all you want, but uh, uh, and, and you can study the causes of obesity and and uh, um, and ha how to mitigate it. But you just confuse things if you stretch the meaning of words beyond the way that most people understand it. And I'm seeking uh, insight and understanding and communication. And so when I use violence, I, I really mean uh, physical force. Okay. Uh, and that, that's the way it's commonly understood. Uh, it doesn't mean that inequality is, uh, isn't itself a bad thing, but uh, the fact that uh, Jeff Bezos makes more money than, than I do is really, really different from um, someone sticking their, their, uh, a knife into someone else's heart to steal their, their, their wallet or rounding up Jews at the edge of, edge of a pit and, and shooting them in the back of the neck. They're just really different phenomenon, even if uh, more than one thing in life is regrettable, deplorable. Uh, if you call them all violence, then you're really not going to understand anything. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, in the particular cases, uh, in the case of abortion, you're absolutely right that the abortion debate is the debate over whether we ought to consider abortion to be a form of violence. And if you believe that a, um, an embryo is a, um, a human being, then uh, with the same moral status as a human being, then abortion is a form of violence. The, uh, I didn't take up the abortion debate in Better Angels, partly because uh, I suspected that the vast, vast majority of my readership uh, had already made up their mind that abortion is not a, uh, a form of violence. Otherwise, they would 
Um, although you know, some, some do, there are pro-lifers who consider abortion tantamount to murder. Um, I don't, most people I know don't, uh, but it is still a question to be debated. As it happens, I actually did talk about the, the history of abortion and abortion itself, uh, as a matter of fact, is in decline. Uh, now it rose uh, to a peak in the, probably the um, early 80s, but since then, abortions have been going down in virtually every country in the world. So even if you do consider abortion a form of violence, it actually uh, conforms to the, the overall pattern. Uh, land exclusion, I mean, there, there is a, a sense in which that is a form of violence to the extent that um, governments enforce property rights. And therefore, if you trespass, uh, men with guns will, will, will force you to leave and might put you in jail if you, if you do it repeatedly. And so one could uh, indeed argue whether, uh, and, but for that matter, all laws, all government is a form of violence. This is the, the uh, Max Weber's definition of government is a, uh, the body that has the exercises of legitimate use of force. Uh, and as long as we've got rule of law, as long as we, uh, people can't just uh, go out and do whatever they want without consequences from you know, a democratically elected um, a court, court system, uh, then, then uh, one can ask the question, is it okay to tolerate um, some forms of violence, namely uh, the rule of law, in order to minimize other forms of violence, such as uh, constant raiding of, um, uh, of territory by neighboring tribes, each of whom tries to um, push the other off, off the land? Or are we better off having a disinterested third party set of referees, uh, police uh, under the guidance of the rule of law? And that raises the whole issue of, uh, of course, whether the police are actually doing that or overstepping their uh, democratically licensed uh, function, the topic very much in the news these, this past few weeks. Um, but yeah, th that would be a case in which it, there is violence, but I think that uh, it's better to localize the violence in a democratically controlled um, court system and police force than to uh, have an anarchy where uh, each side um, meets out its own justice against the others, because we just know historically that leads to vendettas and blood feuds and cycles of violence with uh, much greater violence overall. So it's a little bit of violence in that case to uh, prevent much greater violence. Now in the case of hunter-gatherers, there's, there's really two different debates here. One of them is, would it be better to be a hunter-gatherer in terms of how, how uh, good life is compared to alternatives like the first peasant societies? The answer is probably yes, because uh, toiling in the uh, field from sun up to sundown, um, being a feudal uh, serf, uh, being a laborer in a factory at the outset of the Industrial Revolution were probably pretty grim ways to live. Mm -hmm. I think that's less true of the way the majority of people live, live uh, now. Uh, and it's also important not to romanticize the life of the hunter-gatherers because even though there is that factoid that they only gather food for three hours a day, they often spend enormous amounts of time preparing the food, like pounding um, uh, nuts with rocks, um, fetching water, uh, and doing things that we count as work, like having arguments that go into the middle of the night about divorces and about sharing and about uh, um, uh, work responsibilities. So if you add up uh, the amount of work that hunter-gatherers do, it's actually, um, uh, it takes up a lot of, a lot of their day. Um, now that doesn't even raise the issue of uh, levels of violence. And the uh, in, in better angels of our nature, I suggest that one of the reasons for the transition from um, hunter-gatherer to state societies is that in general, state societies have less overall levels of violence. That when you have, a, and of course, the, they have states that themselves uh, implement a lot of violence, like slavery, like human sacrifice, like conscription. But on the other hand, when you uh, have uh, constant cycles of um, feuds and raids and ambushes with your neighbors, which is uh, very common in non-state societies, in tribal societies, um, then uh, there is some security to living within the walls of a city where you know you won't be uh, abducted by the, the, the tribe next door. So it's a kind of a devil's bargain uh, for the first people that, uh, that, that abandon the hunter-gatherer way of life. Uh, it can be extraordinarily dangerous. 
Uh, but life in the, in the first state societies was no picnic either. Yeah, thank you. Really interesting. Um, so we're just about at time, but with the last few minutes, I'd love to hear about what you're mulling over now, what you're thinking about. Are you writing another book at this time? Um, yeah, what, what, are, what are your thoughts? Glad you asked. Uh, I am writing a book. I, I have uh, recently completed teaching a course in Harvard's general education curriculum called Rationality, and I am uh, turning that course into a book. Uh, tentative title is Rationality, What It Is, Why It's Scarce, Why It Matters. Uh, and it's a combination of uh, tutorials on, uh, again, going back to our theme of juxtaposing the psychology and the, the, the normative theories, uh, uh, discussion of tools of rationality like uh, game theory, rational choice theory, Bayesian reasoning, statistical decision theory, logic, uh, with the relevant psychological literatures and why we often flout um, Bayesian reasoning and logic and uh, um, uh, rational choice theory, uh, and uh, what, if anything, can be done to make us collectively more rational. Really interesting. And when is that book projected to come out? Um, it could be a year from the fall, depending on how um, efficient I am at writing it. Okay, very cool. That's, that's really neat. I look forward to that coming out. Um, Steve, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time and the conversation. It's been a lot of fun to get to dialogue with somebody whose work I've read for a long time. So thank you. It's a pleasure, Amber. Thanks so much for having me and good luck with this series and with your own work. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you have questions, comments, suggestions, or requests, contact me at www.moralsciencepodcast.com. The Moral Science Podcast is sponsored by listeners like you. If you enjoy this series, please consider leaving a tip at www.patreon.com forward slash moral science. Music throughout the program is My Kruby by Kindswider and can be found at www.freemusicarchive.org.